No. <laughs> All right, we are going to talk about connecting rods. Otherwise known as the con rod. All right, so what does the connecting rod do? It does. It transmits the force of the piston to the crankshaft. Trans transmits the force of the piston to the crank shaft. Um, it is made of what? High strength steel. High strength steel. High strength, I'll say alloy steel. Um, they are rather lightweight though, so they must be lightweight. Must be lightweight. And one of the things about why should they be lightweight is, well, they're actually starting and stopping continuously. So we say stop, they have to stop and change direction. So does the piston stop and change, C -H -A -N. change direction. What will be that? Two times per revolution? Yeah. Two times per revolution. And they must be balanced. So now we're going to start talking about uh, some of the intricacies of when you put together an engine. You have to, you know, you're given a crankshaft. A crankshaft's fine. You have a camshaft, and that's okay. We have to have the crank. But we start looking now at things that are actually moving back and forth. Weight becomes an issue. And so you want all of your connecting rods to be at least a close to matching weight. If you don't, you've got an out of balance engine and an out of balance engine is not going to be fun for anybody. So let me see, how much balanced? The balance should be one half ounce, one half ounce, which is 14 grams for my drug people or less, <laughs> you know who you are, or less um, between opposing sides. <coughs> opposing sides. Which means that the one and the two must be half an ounce, within half an ounce, but the one and the four, they don't have to be, they don't have to correlate because then the four and the, the three are going to be opposites, and they have to correlate. Which is not to say that I wouldn't care. I balanced everything. I want four or six rods that all match. But if one didn't, I mean, you can't really swap them around. But I'd be a cause of concern, and I would get a different rod. That's what I would do. Uh, do you just have like a digital scale that you weigh them on? Yeah, we have, and we have them in the tool room here too. Oh. So I expect you guys to do that. Just go grab a scale. So yeah, want to check them out. Uh, between opposing sides, let me see, four rods, that's four rods, four rods, and also half ounce, 14 grams, um, for pistons. And that is according to TCM. I don't believe I was able to find any data from Lycoming that said what they want. So... If I don't have any data from Lycoming, what would I do? Call them before you use. What? Call them. And say, well, it's not published. Go by this. Then you use your best yeah. judgment. Yeah, I, say, Katie, I go by this. If Lycoming didn't say anything, I want some I want I want to make them nice and balanced. So if Continental says the worst they could be is half ounce off, I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with something. I'm not gonna not care. Figure it out. Uh, Lycoming's kind of funny about how they do this. Lycoming uses, uh, let's see, rods, I'll put rods marked, marked A, B, C, D, E, and S. 
I know. <laughs> so A is the lightest. So when I so this is kind of how it works in my mind. Um, they make them, and then they're going to stamp them with a letter. And so the lightest ones are going to get an A, and E is heaviest. Is the heaviest. So what about the S? Shit. <laughs> expensive. Yeah, expensive. Right? <laughs> Not expensive. expensive. Also, S's are done like dollar signs. <laughs> they really are, because sometimes an S and a five look very, pretty pretty close to the same, and you don't want to figure that out. So or you want to get those mixed up. So so to be proper, we put that. S E R V I. Service, service, and what that means is it's kind of a medium. It's sort of a medium weight. Um, and the idea is use this rod, medium weight. Use this rod. Use this rod when replacing. just one rod. So for some strange reason, you're working on an engine and you need to replace just one rod and you don't have any stampings on the other rods and so you're completely clueless as to what you want. Apparently what Lycoming wants you to do is to call up and order an S weight because it's somewhere around the C mark. Apparently, I don't want to just get a C if you ask me. But that's, that was what their point was. I have a better idea. How about weigh the one the opposite and get the right one? Because you can call a lot of companies like ASS. I bought a lot of stuff from them. And they, they refurbish rods and stuff. And when you call a company like that, and you say, hey, I need a rod. And the guy on the phone really knows his stuff. And the first question is going to be is, what weight? I'm like, oh, because you're smart. So you tell him the weight. And you say, ah, I got one of those. Balance it nicely. So anyway, that's what it is. What did you say? I don't know. Did you hang up on me? Okay. <laughs> He just shake his head and go, oh, so what do you want then? <laughs> uh, usually an H or I beam construction. Near as I can tell, an I and an H are the same, just one lays on its side and one doesn't. Um, I reference them, or the industry does, as large end and big ends. We'll talk about the large end first. Large end. Large end. And that is the part that connects to the crankshaft. Connects to the crank. You will notice, hopefully, that it is stamped, stamped with, what is it stamped with? The cylinder number. Abbreviate that. Cylinder hashtag, what is cylinder hashtag? Um, okay, on some rods, some rods, this means nothing. So in other words, the rod is perfectly symmetrical. It was stamped at the factory, and they just stamped the rod number. But they're going to stamp it on the rod and the cap. And those two numbers do have to go together. But other than that, it really is a matter of the orientation, although the book is going to tell you it does. It's just the rod is totally symmetrical. And if I think you were to accidentally put the rod in upside down, I don't think anything bad would happen. I'm not going to try it, but near as I can tell, it's symmetrical. It wouldn't matter. But some rods, some rods, the number must, uh, I'll say go on correctly or be orient, orientated correctly, must be, must be orientated correctly. to ensure proper spray of oil. Kevin. Uh, next to E said usually H or I. Beam, beam. yeah. Oh, beam, okay. Beam. So the one, two, three, four <coughs> on each uh, connecting rod comes from light coming like that? Yes, they do. Do they have a special way so they don't like bend it or? I don't, I don't watch, I've never watched them stamp it. 
I'm sure they do, yes. No, they've been. <laughs> no, they, of course they do. And they are matched. They're a match set. You can't just call up and say, I need a cap, or I just need a, <clears throat> yeah, I've got the number four cap. I just need a new rod. I don't want to pay for the whole rod. I already got the cap. Still good. Right? You got to, you got to, it's a match set. You got to get both sides. Um, but what I mean about the spray of oil, the smaller continentals, I know for sure they're this way. And what happens is, oh boy, I'm not going to be able to draw this one out because I have to draw a crankshaft and knock all the rods. But if we have a rod, yeah, that's not bad. All right. Here's the piston over here. What? There's my piston. Okay. So we got the rod down here. There's actually a hole drilled and it sprays oil in a certain orientation. And what it's supposed to be doing is spraying oil, guess what? At this cylinder over here. And so we've got one that's gonna spray this. Well, if I put this upside down, which way is the oil gonna go? Might spray this way. Maybe this is the accessory case right here. Is that gonna help this cylinder? No, so you got to get it going the right way so that the oil is spraying. So that's why it's, it's got to be orientated correctly to get that spray to spray across to the next cylinder, which is what lubricates that cylinder. It's part of its design. You mess that up, you know, messed up. Uh, I could put match set. Match, match set. Match set, that's the cap and rod. Cap and rod are matched. Can't change them out. Um, what else about the big end? Well, I told you about the critical service bulletin uh, Lycoming has. If you haven't read it, and you have to clean the big end with some Scotch Bright and look in there, and what they're looking for is fretting. What's fretting? Like metal rubbing. Metal rubbing against metal. So what they were finding is these bearings that has a steel backing was just rubbing a little bit in there, a little <coughs> bit of chatter, and it was causing. And it almost looked like an arc strike. Anybody here um, a welder? And if you have an arc welder, you just kind of drag it along something real quick, you get little, um, it's called arc strikes. It's where the, the arc just went real, real quick, but didn't actually do any welding. And that's exactly what it looks like. Like somebody hit it with an arc welder in a very small spot. Like, that's really weird. But what that is, it's, it's the uh, beginning, it's fretting corrosion. And that causes a, a stress riser that was causing the rods to fail in service. And when you lose a rod in service, you have to kind of think that through. That means you're going to lose at least one cylinder, and you're going to have something flying around inside of that, that engine. And it's going to make noise and do damage. And so you don't want that. So you had to uh, do this critical inspection, which still, still stands. Do the inspection. And if you have any fretting in there that you have to have them reworked. And what you do is you send them out to somebody who can do this because it's really a specialized thing. And they, cut, they shave off a little bit of where the cap and the rod go together. So now they come together just a little bit more than they used to. And then they bore it out to the right size. So that is quite a job. Uh, that's the large end. We can talk about small end. And yes, we really do call it big end and small end. And it connects. Connects to the piston pin. It's a piston pin. Is piston not the proper term in aviation? Nah, it's really not. Okay. We call it piston pin, but I know you guys call it wrist pin. I just kind of. So, so gadget doesn't work either. Gadget. 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 No. Thingamabob. No. I got three of these things. What about on the Merlins? Don't they call them gudgeon pins? Oh, because they're British. America. This is America. I don't. I don't. I don't acknowledge the royalty. <laughs> <laughs> this is what World War II was all about, so that we didn't have to deal with that kind of stuff. <laughs> all right, small end connects to the piston pin. Well, your small end. I, now I'm now I'm making up stuff as I go here. Um, contains. Contains the piston, P I S T piston, pin bushing. Right, that's that bronze gold colored looking thing in there. How do you suppose they get that thing in there? <coughs> it's actually quite a little operation to put that in there. Um, light combing, light combing the bushings are they come already super thin, and they're not even completely round. Oh, well, they're round, but they're, they have an opening, which is kind of odd. 
And this opening has to actually clock in a certain position. And I don't know why, but you have to clock it in a certain position when you install it. And you put it in, and you, so you, you put it in with a press, and then you have to broach it to size. And I don't know, to tell you what a brooch is, it's not a thing you have on your shirt. But it's got like little, I don't know, little rings all the way down. Of course, you know, it's got to be 3D, but. Little cuts at a time. Um, and these little, and so they're kind of like, you know, you can see and they look like that. And that's a terrible picture. And I, don't, I couldn't find a picture of a brooch, but there are these little rings. And these rings just, they're, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. But you really can't even tell. You have to take a, a, a micrometer and actually measure them to see that they are getting bigger. So it's, they're rather long. Like the one for this is about, about that long. And then you've got another pilot here, just like the top. And so you put it in and you put it in a press and you press this brooch through. And as the brooch goes through, each one of those rings gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it presses it, presses it and swells it into its cavity. Right, so I mean, it is really in there now at this point. They are, you can't get it. If you try to get it out, you're going to ruin it. You got to put a new one in, but they're only a couple bucks each, so it's not a big deal. But um, so anyway, you, you broach it, and then what you have to do is you have to cut them or hone them to size. And so some shops actually use like a hone that will go in there and just uh, wear it out. Basically, it's uh, two blades that'll go around with a, an abrasive on it and will hone it to side, size. Uh, in my shop, we used a thing called a Tobin ARP. I can't even find a picture anymore. But it used a single flyweight cutter. And so what we had a cutter is about, about that long, but it had one little tiny blade on it. So a single, single cutter. And what it would, you would set it up in this machine. It was really cool. You had to use like a magnifying glass to measure and get the veneer perfectly right. But once you set the machine up, it would send this cutter through the rod. And it didn't matter if that rod had twist or see, twist or convergence, it didn't matter. It went straight through it and came out. And when we were done, you had a rod that was 100% true in twist and convergence. It didn't matter if the rod was or not. So you had to set the proper height between the two, twist, convergence. It was quite a cool little machine. So that's how you do that. Continental, they're not quite as hard. You just skip the brooch process. The brooch thing is a continental thing. Uh, sorry, it's a Lycoming thing. Continental, they were... Um, I hate putting those in because they just always pulled metal when you put them in. But um, it's just a much fatter bushing. You put it in, just just cut it. No, small end. Uh, let's see. Three basic types of con rods. Three basic types of con rods. I wish I still had that shop. It was fun. I would always get uh, tours from the school down there. We had a good time down there running a lot of stuff. All right. Types of con rods. Uh, the plane. Plane with an L, P, L, A, I, N, plane. Um, that's what you have. So used on opposed engines. Opposed engines. Um, inline engines as well. Inline engines as well. Um, Well, I don't want to get too wordy, but I guess I will. Uses a pressed in piston pin bushing. <coughs> pressed in piston pin bushing. Um, uses bearings, plain bearings, plain bearings on the big end. But you know that because you already have it. And it, of course, it is a two-piece rod and cap. And by the way, that is how I label the bearings that come out of there. Number one rod, number one cap. You guys had all kinds of weirdness. I've got bottom, I've got top, I've got right, I've got left, I've got, what other kind of weirdness did you guys have out there? Huh? Inner outer. Inner outer. <laughs> no, rod and cap. R and C. R and C, rod and cap. All right, we've got the plane. All right, we've got the forked type. Fork type used on V-type engines. See, I got 
a picture somewhere. Slide. Which type is this? Plane. 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 <laughs> type is that? Squished. That is squished. You guys have all seen this and heard this story? No. No. Where is this rod? Does anybody know? Is it across the street? Last time I saw it was in NDT. It's over in NDT. Okay, so I'll tell you two things about that. How did this happen? Anybody care? If you don't know, you can just be quiet. <laughs> if anybody doesn't know, can you care to guess? Detonation? Oh, it was there. No. <laughs> it just wasn't here. Yeah. It was here. <laughs> so, some people, and, and I, I do this too, uh, sometimes it is easier to put the piston into the cylinder while it's on the bench. You have the ring compressor, and, and um, I built a lot of engines this way. And so I would get, you know, oil up my cylinder, and I would get the piston ready, and I would get my ring compressor, and I would press the piston right inside the barrel while it's sitting on the bench. And then I would pick up the whole assembly and walk over and hold it, and I would take the piston pan and go through the piston, the rod, and the other side of the piston. Okay, then you push the cylinder the rest of the way on. And there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. Unless you're not holding it right and you put the piston pin in through the piston pin, through the piston, miss the connecting rod, and go down the other side of the piston. <laughs> and so now here's the small end of the connecting rod and here is the piston. And when you start it, that con rod just kind of does that and hammers down flat. And that just cost, was it, I don't know, I wrote it down, the guy gave it to me. Uh, I think it said $23,000 is what, uh, what it cost. This did not crack. I magnafluxed it. There's not a crack on it. There, there's some little stresses right around some of this stuff, but it did not crack. So what does that tell you about this? It's malleable. Malleable is a good word. Is it nitrided? No. Mm -mm. So they're made to be soft. And they're soft. That's why I kind of get a little freaked out when you're like, hey, be careful. Don't, don't twist them. They'll twist. So, yeah, that'll ruin your day. I mentioned the guy Smitty I used to work with. He'd always say, it takes a whole lot of attaboys to make up for one-off shit like that. <laughs> All right, there's your blade and fork, the fork type. You have a blade and the fork and the V type. And I've never worked on one of those. Huh? Never and I never have out in the field. I just never worked on V-type. All right. What is this type? Radial. Radial. Okay. What is it called? Master, master and? Well, ma here's the master rod. And these are, no, Alan. <laughs> articulating rods. So master and articulating rods. These things in the middle that hold them are called the knuckle pins, you knuckleheads. <laughs> what kind of bearing goes into here? A big one. <laughs> uh -uh, you're looking at it. What kind of bearing is that? Plain bearing. Use a plate. Why did? Why do we not use a roller or ball here? Adds a whole lot of weight. If I add weight to this, I have to add weight to the counterweights. So I don't want to do that. Right. Um, this, is this a one-piece or a two-piece master rod? A one-piece. So that means the crankshaft must be two-piece, or you're going to have a hard time getting it around. And on. <laughs> Nuts. All right. Some of you, some of you are a, a day late for this next part. All right, so fork type, and then we have the master and articulating rod. Master and articulating rod. Uh, you already told me this used on radials. So we have one master rod. Master rod. Um, no, I do say this. Okay, master rod. Uh, the remaining, remaining are articulating. One master and the remaining are articulating rods. 
How many articulating rods does a nine-cylinder radial have? Eight. eight. Right on, eight. How many articulating rods does a six-cylinder radial have? There is no such thing. Don't say that. <laughs> Got to be an odd number, unless it was double row of three. <laughs> be a whole lot of effort for right. importance. Importance of knowing. Knowing where the master rod is. Before you ever attempt to take a cylinder off of a radial engine, the first thing you should look up is where is the master rod? Number one. Sometimes. Uh, light combing is number seven. Mm. Just off here on the side. I don't know why. You know, this is what they did. So, um, and why is this important? Because you'll break the rings. You yep, you'll break the rings. So what happens is without the master rod being held inside of its cylinder, it, it goes up and down. But once that cylinder's removed, it's mm -hmm. allowed to go side to side. And when it goes to one side, it pulls this articulated rod out a little bit further than it ever did before. And when it does that, that there usually has an oil ring, the last ring down at the, the end, the oil scraper. That ring is right near the end of the piston and it gets really close to the end of the cylinder, just right almost to the end and it goes the other way. But it's fine as long as the master rod is held in place and it's only going straight up and down. But you take off that cylinder and it rocks and it pulls that out just a little bit and you hear a little tink. And that tink just costs you money because what was that little tink you heard? That ring just came out and snapped out. Well, now it's not going to go back in. But if you didn't know this about the master rod, you probably didn't know what that tink was. And so the next thing you do is grab the propeller. You go, well, it's a little stiff. There it goes. <laughs> it's all better now. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's only the last ring. So, you know, it's just, you'll get pieces in the oil sump with part numbers on it. Hey, what's this all about? So a cil let's see what I am. The cylinder with... The master rod, the rod cylinder with the master rod um, needs to be needs to be last off first on. and first on. Or the piston, or the piston on another cylinder uh, will, let me see, will slip down and break the lower ring. There, right, we'll just leave it with that. Um, still talk about master rods. Maybe um, one piece, uh, which means you need a two piece crank. Or it may be two pieces, which could mean it goes on a one piece crank. And those things in the middle, the, the things that held the articulating rods to the master rod are called what? Knuckle pins. N-U-K-N-U-C-K, knuckle pins. And they hold the articulating rods to the master rod. Hold the articulating rods to the master rod. Yes? Uh, so if there's like two pieces, is it always gonna be a one piece crank? No, not always. Not always. So no, it still could be still be, it could still be a, probably. I was just thinking about the engines I worked on and they were pretty much all one piece because the cranks are two piece. Yeah. Not a lot, maybe three or four. Yeah. 
master rod for every row of radial cylinders? Yeah, you'd have to. So three or four ever, or three or four different types? Uh, three or four ever. I probably, well, if I think about it, yeah, I assisted on a lot more, but by myself, probably three, three, but I assisted on a bunch more. All Continentals and Lycomings, mostly Continentals. Do aviation rings come in sets, or can you buy them separately? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to rings. That's next week's the top end. I don't want to ruin it, and then nobody's going to want to show up. Yeah. All right. Rod, bolts, and nuts. What am I going to say about this? Well, I guess we can start with the obvious here. Unless otherwise specified, unless otherwise specified or stated, unless otherwise stated, rod bolts, rod bolts and nuts should be, probably should write must, should be replaced when removed. These are bolts are under high tension. They are rather pricey. They can get very expensive, actually, up into the hundreds of dollars a piece. You don't want to make a mistake when using them. Uh, let's see. I will just read you this uh, from Service Instruction 1458 Golf. Any time connecting rod bolts and nuts are removed, discard both of the connecting rod bolt and nut, figure one, and replace them with service use only conrod bolts and nuts for the corresponding conrod assembly in table one. So in other words, when you take apart your engine like you guys did, then I always save the connecting rod nuts and bolts for the purpose of bolting them together as you're doing now for the inspection. When I'm done with the inspection, they go in the trash pile and the brand new ones come out and they go in when it goes on the crankshaft and you put them on and you torque them and if you make a mistake because you have the numbers going the wrong way on the crankshaft, then or can't, yeah, crankshaft, then you have to just buy, just buy new ones. One of the things that's gonna I didn't write it down in my notes, but I know it's gonna true probably won't. This is this class just never ceases to amaze me. Uh, at, at the things that the other classes have historically all screwed up on. And it's not like I'm telling you a secret. I'm standing back and watching, waiting for somebody to screw up so I can, I know I got to step in. Okay, that's not how you do it. You know, don't make it. You guys are just all getting it. Some of the hardest things that, that the other classes haven't got, you guys all seem to be just grasping without any problem at all. Like so, huh? Like what? Uh, like the crankshaft <laughs> measurement, the, the end play. Almost everybody seems to be getting that. The other classes are just completely lost. So I don't even know what to do. I'm like, well, you got to put the crank in the crank case. I do, and then they'll put it in. I'm like, with the bearings, you know. It's uh, oh, well, that doesn't make any sense. There's so much more Yeah. Yeah. Because we need to sometimes connect the. Yes, that's what I just said. Yeah. The old ones are for inspection, not the new ones. So, all right. Um, but anyway, what I was going to say is the, the other thing that that I don't think you'll get wrong because I'm telling you now is when you put the connecting rods on, all of the numbers have to face the bottom of the engine. On a Continental, they all face the top of the engine. So one does it one way, one does the other. But you have to stop and think about it, and you have to actually set it up, and you say, okay, as I'm looking at my crankshaft, if the one three is going to come on this side, and this is the top over here, then this is the bottom, then I should see my rod um, down here. One, I should see the one, and the three, and they should be going this way. And the two and four should be going this way, and the cases should come on this way, right? And sometimes I'll see they put them all sticking out. So every one of them is pointing at top dead center, and the numbers go up. I'm like, no, they can't all be at top dead center at once. <laughs> well, I know, you just move them this way. I'm like, okay, now those numbers are over here, and these are over here. I'm like, oh. And, and you can just see the look in there like, I have no idea how to get them on the same side. 
Do I need a torch? You know, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> no. Wait, one more question. When you said the numbers are facing the bottom of the top. Yeah. You meant like if I was looking at the flange. I meant the bottom of the engine. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Don't picture it on the stand. Yeah. Okay. I will never talk about the bottom of your engine as being the front. Because yeah, <laughs> I'm not going out. In the, don't be going out in the field. And, uh, so you want me to put the prop on the bottom of the engine, right? <laughs> I should have made a special stand for you so that it came apart this way. So we could, um, and so the easy way to remember that, I had to stop and think, the numbers on the light coming go to the, okay, you got to run. It is, I just wrote, and on my little uh, QC sheet that I have in my shop, it clearly said, uh, verify all numbers are away from the cam. Because that's the difference between a continental light combing other than the color, is uh, on light combing, they put the cam up top, so that means the rod numbers are down here, and on continental, they put the cam on the bottom, which means the rod numbers are up here. So rod numbers go away from the cam. Now you got it on no matter what engine you're working on. So I mean, if you're low on brain power, you got to think of things like these. So you, can, you know. Uh, all right, where was I? Uh, okay, so you got thrown away. Uh, here we go. Oops, this is this is kind of like over here. One, two. Nut position is critical. In other words, don't screw it up. Kevin. <laughs> Here we have a series of connecting rod bolts. What's the difference between this one and this one? What is an obvious difference? What about the head? Not the shape of the head, but what is... This has some printing and stuff on it. What about this one? This one is machined up here. And this is a machine surface right, right there. So these are stretch bolts. You actually tor you torque them to a stretch with a micrometer. Now there's some torquing involved in there. So you have to torque them to a certain, you measure them, then you torque it to a certain limit and the bolt shouldn't have moved by X number. Um, it's gotta still be like the same. Then you, then you torque it to a stretch, but you can't exceed a certain torque limit. So it's just checks and balances. But these are the really expensive ones, I think. Jeez, it's been a long time to put an engine together, but these were running at about 150 a piece. Oh. Oh. A bolt or a set? Bolt. Yeah. Uh, back in the day, these were somewhat reusable. I never used them, but okay. So here we have some nuts. Which is the part that goes towards the machine surface? Does this right here? go towards the surface, or is this away from the surface? It's away. No, it's towards the surface. I don't know, just tell us. No! See that little washer looking thing? It is not a little washer thing. This is backwards. This is correct. This is backwards. Think of it that way. That's what I do. If you think of it like a self-locking, it's not. I don't know what the heck that thing is for. I think it's just a just to differentiate between the uh, the pros and the novices. This is the way it goes. This is backwards. I just found this on the internet. You know, I was just looking for something like, hey, check it out, it's totally backwards. Then it was somebody showing how they put, that was, I think it was like a YouTuber showing how to put their, put your engine together. You know, so no, that is completely and totally wrong. So that is a no. All right, that is a big no. Nut position is critical, let me see. Do not ups, do not, what am I right? Do not, do not install upside down. So the castellated part of the nut doesn't go upside down? <laughs> um, let's see, flat side, flat side toward rod. Raised lip. Um, outward. Uh, mandatory replacement at overhaul. I think that's being redundant. Um, oh, I'll just write it. There is a list, uh, service bolt in 240, that, if I got that right, 
tells you all of the things that you have to replace mandatory at overhaul. Also has a list of things you have to replace mandatory if you just remove them. You take that off, you throw it away. So I think that's 240. But these are mandatory. M -A -N -D -A -T -O -R, mandatory replacement at overhaul. Um, there are, let's see if I can get this way, maybe two types. We have torque, torque only, and stretch bolts. And tightened to a specific length. Um, an interesting thing, at least to me, maybe not to you, is that a lot of, who has an engine with, uh, uh, across the street with cotter pins in them, right? All manufacturers have gone away from cotter pins. What they, I don't know, I'm just going to say what, it's, what it seems to be they've realized, and what I've heard is, and I don't have data to prove this, but they, they discovered that they were getting more problems with the cotter pins than they were solving. So me mechanics weren't installing the cotter pins right. They were cutting the ends off and they were flying off and getting inside the engines. They're finding them inside the engine. Uh, so they were having all these problems with them. And then they realized that even if they fell out, they never had a problem with them coming loose. So really, the ones you're looking at light combing, they're more <clears throat> my favorite. They're not any kind of locking nut at all. They just go on, you tighten them up, and they, they boom, they stay. And so some of you don't have the ones with uh, cotter pins. If you have one with cotter pin, the first group to get done, I think I have one set that I'll swap out for you that doesn't have cotter pins. So, and then Continental, they've gone to some really bizarre kind of a, a, a lock nut that has some sort of s internal spiral locking thing where you torque it on and then to, to get it off, you have to kind of go, a, a, a part of it turn tight and then you back them off and throw them away. Yeah, you had a question? Um, if you're if you change it from the castellated nut to like a standard nut or whatever, do you put new bolts without the hole? Yes. Like in our case? Yes. You, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay. It's a new, whole new set. Of course, oh, you have to remember. Over there. Like, are you going to give us new bolts? Yeah, I'll do the whole thing. Okay. I would never do that. So, but of course, you know, it, and so how do you know this stuff? You know, you're building an engine, and that's one of the really tricky things about um, building engines. We've been working on planes sometimes, but especially engines. You know, your part. You're part mechanic and you're also part research and historian. I had an incredible library of just stuff that would help me get through stuff because you would think that you would just, just buy a new parts manual, right? Hey, I'm gonna build this engine, I'll just buy a brand new parts manual and it's gonna be easy. I'm just gonna flip to that page and it's gonna have a part, uh, the nut right there and the bolt. I'm just gonna order that. It's gotta be the latest and the greatest. It's not. So you're, you're gonna look at those part numbers and then you're gonna go to order and you're gonna find out, well, that's, you know, if you work with somebody really good, like I worked with AVL, and they were great. You can call them up and say, well, this is the part number I need, and then they would, they would help you out. And they're like, okay, that's got to supersede to this, which supersedes to that. Oh, but if you use this superseded bolt, you've got to use this superseded nut, and they'd help you along. Um, but otherwise, I had, I had all these publications that would have superseded parts, and then you'd cross-reference it to a service instruction, and that's usually where you'd find it. you just like, uh, okay, so one thing I'm doing nice for you guys uh, who had a bolt in the rear of the engine underneath the cam with a cotter pin? The Allen, Allen's group, I think, is the only one left. Last year, I made a decision that all of you with safety wire, that was new. I modified all of the engines to use safety wire instead of a cotter pin. How can I do that legally? Service. That's just cool. Nobody cares. No. It's a service, <laughs> it's a service instruction. There's a service instruction that says, Light Cummings says, hey, we are, now, we are no longer going to produce a camshaft and a gear that bolts on. And my assumption is because they can unbolt. They don't like that. So they're going to make a gear and a camshaft all in one, and good luck trying to get that cotter pin in there. It's impossible. So what they said is, don't worry about it. You're going to drill a little bit hole, and you need some safety wire. That's all you got to do. So that's what I did. I used part of the service instruction to drill the hole. And not that it matters because it's a school. But 
Uh, anyway, okay, so this is something that specifically came from the Lycoming School. Two things. A rod. A rod cannot, cannot handle. Katie, I would be interested to know what two things you would come up with. Throwing it out a window and not putting, <laughs> and not putting the pin in. Yes, dropping from a yes. So dropping it from a high spot and not putting it and pounding it with the piston pin. You are correct. It cannot handle that. They did not mention those things. All right, lack of oil. Lack of oil. But that almost it's like well. Is there something in the engine that really does well with the lack of oil? I don't know. And looseness of rod bolts. Spark plugs don't really like oil. Looseness of rod bolts. Bolts. And then I have on mine, in all capital locks, so I'll capital lock here, use proper lube. So you have to use the proper lubricant when putting the nuts and bolts on. And I wrote in my notes here, I can't remember if it's been changed or not. It is food grade lubricant. Well, we're just gonna find out. I'm not gonna write it. We're gonna see what it says in the latest serve instruction. But I believe that the latest thing, I know it was for a while, it was food grade lubricant. So some, some engineer figured out exactly, and I'm sure they had a trial and error on that. They probably tried non-food grade lubricant. <laughs> All right, uh, break time. No, it's literally mayonnaise. I mean, it's not.